Optimal health for high performers. This is the Health Upgrade Podcast with Dr. Nawaz Habib. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Health Upgrade Podcast. Really excited for today's episode. Today, we're talking about bone and bone health. And I'm here with JP Erico. How are you, JP? Doing very well. Thank you. So I'm really excited about today's topic because I'm a chiropractor by training and by profession. And the understanding the bones, the joints, the motion patterns of the body was really where a lot of my interest in health started. And so for me, understanding why bone is healthy or why it becomes unhealthy has always been a really interesting piece to the puzzle. I remember learning about the different bone cells, the osteoblast, the osteoclast, the osteocytes. I remember learning about all of the mechanisms that were involved in the production of healthy bone and also all of the conditions that can occur, most commonly osteoporosis, that can occur when bone health or when overall health are less than optimal. And so I want to talk today about what are the challenges that lead to bone density loss or bone mineral loss and the mechanisms that we can utilize to actually improve it. And believe it or not, there is a lot of really great research on how vagus nerve involvement and autonomic nervous system involvement plays a very positive role here. So that's what we'll get into today. Why don't we start with the issue of osteoporosis and where it kind of comes from and who is most likely to experience this particular issue? Sure. So osteoporosis is a condition that typically parallels uh, menopause. For women who have, have been through it, they've probably been warned by their gynecologist or by another physician or even by friends that they have to be careful. They have to take calcium supplements and other things, stay active, because bone mineral loss, bone density loss is a real problem as estrogen levels decrease there's a higher propensity for bone mineral loss. There's a bunch of different reasons why that happens. They're all related to one another, and they're related to other symptoms that might be experienced during menopause. Some of the more uncomfortable symptoms that women complain about during menopause are hot flashes and night sweats and mood swings, perimenopausal depression symptoms that last for what some people call the blues period, which might be anywhere from just hours to weeks. And all of that is associated with higher levels of sympathetic activation. We've talked in the past on this podcast about the role of sympathetic activation versus parasympathetic activation in mood. So it's not unfamiliar to listeners how sympathetic activation during that period might lead to those uh, symptoms. Uh, what you might not be aware of is the fact that there are consequences to those vasomotor symptoms that, or I should say associated consequences of menopause, that oftentimes you have a higher risk factor for experiencing cardiovascular symptoms, neurovascular symptoms, stroke, dementia, and osteoporosis. If you are experiencing those vasomotor symptoms like night sweats and hot flashes, moderate or severely, there's evidence to suggest that if you are a person who is experiencing those symptoms uh, more strongly, more uncomfortably, that you are at higher risk in the future for having cardiovascular issues, heart attacks, uh, atherosclerosis, and other things that really, honestly, we can look at and we can say that's associated with sympathetic activation and it's associated with increased inflammation. And inflammation really is, we've talked about this, it's really at the heart of so many different conditions that we experience. Yeah, there's no question about it. I also want to just kind of point to the root cause here, or kind of the, the reason why bone is targeted. And that is, in this particular scenario, calcium is, is stored in the bone, right? We have calcium and magnesium in particular are the two major minerals that are stored in bone for our entire body. And ideally, it stays there and stays at a very high level throughout our entire life. But often there are nutritional deficiencies in calcium and magnesium that will often occur that result in the need for calcium to be exported into the bloodstream and to go to other cells so that the other cells have a little bit of calcium to use. And in short-term little bursts here and there, that can be beneficial, actually, because it can actually help to build up the bone remodeling, 
turn on certain types of cells, the osteoclasts that like to eat away and uh, bring the calcium out of the bone and stimulate osteoblasts to help to produce more bone density and put the calcium back into the bone. So the bone remodeling does need to happen in almost a cyclic fashion. And they both need to be happening at the same time. Where the issue occurs is when the nutritional deficiencies and the inflammation levels increase to a level that its breakdown of the bone occurs much higher than building up of the bone. And so the bone remodeling shifts into a breakdown phase when the body cells are in need of more calcium and magnesium. So this is a really important reason to understand as potentially a root cause for where the breakdown would occur. And then inflammation is one of the mechanisms by which the calcium is being brought out of and uh, stimulating to be brought out and be used in other cells. So just a really uh, important note there. Yeah, and it parallels what, uh, as you were talking, it just, it reminded me of the, of exactly what the liver does with iron. You've got iron that's critically important for carrying oxygen through the bloodstream and, and hemoglobin. It's important in mitochondria for conducting uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Cells need it, cells use it, and yet we have a store of it in the liver. So the bones are acting, obviously, for they have other things that they do structurally, but they are a store of calcium, and calcium is important. And so if you have low levels of dietary calcium or you have inflammation going on in the body, the same way your innate immune cells will hoard iron to prevent bacteria or other or pathogens from accessing that important store of iron. You can see similar things happening it's not for pathological reasons, although that's not out of the realm of possibility as well. You have this store of calcium that's being sort of dipped into or built up depending on your inflammation state. And Bring it back to osteoporosis, when you're in that sympathetically active state where there's a higher level of inflammation because A, you're going through a major metabolic and hormonal change, but you're seeing the withdrawal of estrogen, what you see is an upregulation of inflammation and that activates osteoclasts to tear down bone. So let's talk for a moment about the roles of osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoclasts are innate immune cells. They are the macro, they're the tissue resident macrophage. We've talked about the importance of tissue resident macrophages before. They're the tissue resident macrophages of bone. So their job is to remodel the bone. And we think of bones as sort of being static, but they're actually not. They're a very dynamic environment that constantly needs to be remodeled because we're constantly stressing our bones. In fact, if you don't stress your bones, they will atrophy away. And we know that from uh, people who go up into space and stay in a zero gravity environment, their bones will literally atrophy away tremendously and coming back down to earth into a 1G environment can be very dangerous. They actually have to spend several weeks to months after returning to earth to restore not only their muscles, but their bones because there's this imbalance of resorption versus uh, storage if you will, or rebuilding of bone by the osteoblasts, which are the cells that build bone. So there's this balance between osteoclast and osteoblastic activity. And during childhood, that's a very, it's even more dynamic than it would be in adulthood because you not only have the normal levels of remodeling that have to happen, but layered on top of that, you have the growth and the ability of the, of the person to literally become taller, bones to become longer, bones to become thicker, stronger, to hold a higher weight, and children are more active. And so as a result, you see lots and lots of activity going on with osteoblasts and osteoclasts during that period. When that happens in adulthood, that can be damaging. Much the same way, and I realize I'm tying in something here that's pretty far removed from talking about bones, but what we've talked about before with respect to Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that's associated with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease is this dysregulation of the normal function of the resident uh, tissue resident macrophages of the brain, which is the microglial cells, in synaptogenesis and synaptic pruning. When, because that's a very similar process, it's building up and tearing down, just like osteoclasts and osteoblasts. There's a buildup and a tear down of synapses in the brain, much the same way there's a buildup and tear down of bone in the bone remodeling process. 
when that gets dysregulated in old age because of high levels of inflammation and priming of those cells, you end up tearing down brain matter and brain structures that you shouldn't. And that's exactly what's happening during osteoporosis. You've got this dysregulation due to inflammation of the bone teardown process versus the bone buildup process. Yeah, that's absolutely, I think, very clear parallel and very important to understand. And that's why a lot of these conditions are so closely associated and tend to be occurring either simultaneously or in parallel around this age-based challenge of as we age, we tend to quote unquote deteriorate. It often happens because the sympathetic activation and the inflammatory signals and the challenges that we've experienced have accumulated over time. And we've shifted into a heavier sympathetic state as we get older. And there's more toxin, there's more challenge, there is more inflammatory reasons to be in that state. And so doing our best to stay in a parasympathetic state and build up our parasympathetics to help counterbalance that over a longer period of time is a really important way to achieve health span and longevity in terms of how long we can function as optimal functioning human beings. So it's a really important piece of the puzzle here that age is, is heavily correlated to this. I want to point to the mechanism here. So let's talk about what are some of the signals, what are some of the receptors that are present on these particular cells and how do we get these signals to the bone? Because we know that we have very little, if any, autonomic nerve endings that go to bone and we have 206 bones in the adult human body. We don't have those 206 nerves coming off of the vagus nerve to go to these bones. So how are we getting that signal there? Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So the autonomic nervous system, is, as we've talked about before, has really two major arms. One is the sympathetic and one is the parasympathetic. The sympathetic arm typically uses norepinephrine as its primary neurotransmitter, and uh, the parasympathetic typically uses acetylcholine. And so those are the two major neurotransmitters that we'll be talking about. Connective tissue oftentimes is built, whether it be by uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts or by uh, cells that build up cartilage or other connective tissue follow the gradients of how much norepinephrine versus acetylcholine is being released. The receptors that activate the activity of these cells, in the case of norepinephrine, it's usually beta receptors. And in the case of acetylcholine, it's typically acetylcholine receptors. There are a couple of different types of acetylcholine receptors. There are muscarinic ones and nicotinic ones. The ones that we're going to be talking about are more of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. They have a variety of different types. There's alpha-2, there's alpha-4, beta-3, or alpha-3, beta-4 receptors, which really all refer to a protein subunit, a group of, it's a sort of a polymer of these subunits that stick together at the outside of the, of the receptor. and the version that we're talking about in terms of modulating and have talked about in terms of modulating the immune function are typically the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And they're present on osteoclasts. And so as a result, the autonomic nervous system can control uh, how those osteoclasts function based on inflammation levels as well as neurotransmitter levels. So let me just clarify what I'm saying there. Osteoclasts will respond both to, because they're immune cells, they respond to immune chemicals, and those are cytokines, so things like TNF-alpha and IL-1. So they respond to those, but they also respond to neurotransmitters through either beta receptors or alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So both arms of the autonomic nervous system can affect them. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. The osteoclasts and osteocytes have both beta-2 adrenergic receptors, where they take uh, sympathetic activation, excuse me, and the osteoblasts have alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and the osteoclasts actually have beta-4 and beta-2 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And so they're slightly different in terms of the subunits that are being presented on the different types of cells. 
but the signaling is going to still require both acetylcholine and uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine to help to regulate activity. And it's the balance between these two that's really necessary to be optimal there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just for all for the audience, bringing it sort of back up to, I'm usually the guy who dives in deep, <laughs> just bringing it up to sort of maybe more like the 10,000 foot level. What you've got is uh, during menopause, you have a withdrawal of estrogen, and that leads to a heightened level of inflammation and a heightened level of sympathetic activation. So what the bones are seeing and the cells that are responsible for remodeling these bones, they're seeing a higher level of inflammation and they're seeing a higher level of norepinephrine and not a commensurate higher level of acetylcholine. And so as a result, the shift is in the direction of osteoclastic activity because the osteoclasts are being triggered by the inflammation and triggered by the norepinephrine activation. And as a result, they become active in removing bone mineralization from bone. So you end up with lower density levels in various different points in the body that are really critical. Things like hip fractures occur because the hip has become demineralized and it's not as strong. You get spinal fractures. That's where the, the vertebral body fails and you get uh, compression fractures in the spine, which are very painful and can have neurological consequences. So what you really want to do, I mean, obviously you have wrist fractures and, and leg fractures and arm fractures and things like that that occur as well, especially during falls that can occur as people become a little more frail. And so it's really important to do what we can to prevent osteoclasts from becoming dysregulated this way. Now, the first wave of drugs that were brought to the market the thought was, let's just stop the osteoclasts from acting. They just, they won't tear down bone anymore. And as a result, we'll keep our bones strong. Well, it turns out that that was catastrophically wrong, that you actually need that constant remodeling to take place, because if you don't, then the bones become very brittle. They may still have high levels of, of mineralization in them. You may have stopped the calcium loss, but you didn't stop the bones from becoming brittle and breaking. So these drugs that were stopping osteoclasts from doing what they do entirely really failed. So what you need is a much more nuanced approach. You need to not, not stop the osteoclasts from functioning. You need to balance them functioning properly. So the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is on, as you said, on osteoblasts, Yes. It's, you need to upregulate their activity. And so you do that by increasing parasympathetic tone. It's the same story we've talked about with many different organs. It's showing up again that if you have high levels of inflammation and high levels of sympathetic activation that persist for an extended period of time, you will end up with bone loss because the osteoblast and the parasympathetic side hasn't had a chance to rest, digest, and restore. Let's add rebuild to yeah. it. So it's rest and re digest, restore, and rebuild, because that's when the osteoblasts need to build up what the osteoclasts have torn down in the remodeling process. And the best way to do that is to ensure that you have low inflammation in your body and you've done everything to increase your parasympathetic activation. That's exercise, that's meditation, that's deep breathing, that's sleeping properly. And to the extent that you can't do those things, or you're having difficulty doing those things, you can get a little boost by an electrical stimulation device that stimulates the vagus nerve. Yeah, we'll get to that in a very quick second. But I just want to talk to the point that we don't have nerves going to bone directly that are signaling acetylcholine and norepinephrine out in general. They may go to the bigger bones like the femur or uh, humerus, but they don't go to every single bone in the body. So how do we get this signal diffusely throughout the body to every single bone that we have in our entire body? How does that signaling process work? So you don't have nerves going to every bone, but you certainly have blood supply going. And so the way that it's understood is that when you stimulate the vagus nerve or when you stimulate parasympathetic activity, there's in the spleen, which is a, an organ that has lots of blood flowing through it, when you, in the spleen, there's the ability to 
activate or alter the posture of both circulating cells, they're called monocytes, as well as the resident macrophages that exist in that tissue or in that organ. And when you do that, it upregulates circulating levels of acetylcholine. You get that acetylcholine to those cells, not directly because nerves are, are firing on, this, on the osteoclast or osteoblast, although there is some of that, but it is believed that the majority of it is a function of what's happening through the spleen. This was the original cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. And the good news is the importance of this is that there's systemic things that can happen that can lead to inflammation rising. Obesity is a perfect example. We've talked about that many times. There's autoimmune diseases and other things where you have a regional activation of inflammation that goes systemic. And when that goes systemic, you need a systemic response. So activating the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway through the spleen has the ability to upregulate both the acetylcholine levels in circulation to get to the bone, so you're getting those alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but it also has the ability to reduce the overall cytokine burden that's in the body. Yeah, I, I like to just give this example as well. So we've got the direct innervation of the vagus nerve to essentially every abdominal organ and to particular areas in the thorax and whatnot. So it goes to the heart, the lungs, the gut, and kidneys and all of those areas, there isn't a direct link from vagus nerve to the brain via the vagus nerve. It has, or to the spleen, excuse me. It has to go through the celiac ganglion, which is a sympathetic nerve, and it's sending signals via that sympathetic nerve to the spleen to upregulate acetylcholine. And that acetylcholine activation is like an amplification of that vagus nerve signal throughout the entire body, going everywhere that the nerve doesn't go thus sending that acetylcholine throughout the entire body to the bone and to many other tissues as well where we don't have direct nerve signaling. So it's kind of that second step of that pathway when the vagus nerve is activated, when we're in that parasympathetic state or we are able to shift between sympathetic and parasympathetic regularly and have optimal vagal tone and good HRV levels, that's a direct sign that we're able to send out that acetylcholine signal via that splenic amplification piece that goes out to all of these other tissues. That's how the bone gets the acetylcholine as well as the norepinephrine because we have this balance going up and down via these T cells and monocytes that are circulating, sending that signal out. Yeah, that's uh, you brought up the T cells there at the end and I'd like to just you know spend two seconds talking about the importance because T cells are part of the adaptive immune system. We've spent most of our time talking about the innate immune cells, macrophages, whether they be in the brain like microglial cells, in the liver like Kupfer cells, macrophages in the gut, and osteoclasts. They're all the same type of cell. They're all tissue resident macrophages. Monocytes in circulation can come in as recruited macrophages. They're a little different because they're more pro-inflammatory. But the question is, how do you in the spleen, which as you correctly point out, only has sympathetic innervation. There's only sympathetic nerves going in the spleen releasing norepinephrine. So how do you get the acetylcholine onto those monocytes and those macrophages in order to quiet them down to prevent them from being inflammatory? It turns out that there's an adaptive immune cell, the T cell, but a specific kind of cell called the CHAT cell. And this CHAT cell, I, I think of it like an adapter. You know, if you have a, an Apple computer, you know that they love changing their plugs. Um, and so sometimes you have to buy a little adapter that goes on the tip of your, uh, your plug so that it can get into your new device. That little adapter is what the T cell, the chat cell is. The chat cell has on it beta receptors. So when that sympathetic nerve going into the spleen releases norepinephrine, it responds. And you say, well, okay, that's great. You've got a beta receptor, that T cell responded. What did that chat cell do? That chat cell releases acetylcholine. So it literally is acting like a little adapter, turning that splenic nerve that's sympathetic kind of into a parasympathetic nerve because now the combination is releasing acetylcholine. But the good news is those chat cells, there are other chat cells that can actually go into circulation. And in circulation, it's not just acetylcholine floating through the bloodstream, because that happens too, but you can actually have chat cells that home in on an area of inflammation. 
they go to an area of inflammation and they can release the acetylcholine to lower the activity of the inflammatory cells that are there. Exactly. So we're able to get systemic uh, acetylcholine activation and systemic release of that acetylcholine via these chat cells in the spleen, amplifying that signal out. And then regional, if need be, in an acute scenario where there is a high level of inflammatory cytokine activity, IL-1, IL-6, IL-18, TNF-alpha increases because we have a broken bone or we have a, a bump or something, that's where it can go and send acetylcholine actively in that region. So it's wonderful to be able to do that, as well as obviously more challenging things than just an acute bump or sprain or fracture. Yeah, although I think it's really important to note that when you have a fracture, it's really important that there be inflammation. I mean, you've broken a bone. There's the reason for inflammation to occur. The yeah. question is, how long should that inflammation be there? Well, just like the same way you need to clean a wound out or debride a wound, what you need is those osteoclasts to go in and take away the portions of the fracture that need to be removed so that the bones can come back together and heal with stronger union than they had before. Yeah. And that first stage of inflammation activates those osteoclasts to do that, that portion of the remodeling, which is tearing down. Yes. What you want to do is minimize the amount of time that that takes. You want to be able to shift back into or out of that sympathetically activated state, that inflamed state, into a state in which there's resolution of that inflammation. And uh, a rebuilding, as we talked about before, that rest, digest, restore, and rebuild mode. And so there's a role for osteoclasts. That's why when the first drugs for osteoporosis came out that we talked about that made bones brittle because they stopped osteoclasts from doing what they're doing, osteoclasts have a role, a very important role, in activating the osteoblast to doing what they're doing. You need that first burst of inflammation in order to trigger that resolution of inflammation in the rebuilding process. That happens in the body in so many different places. I know we tend to, to run off and talk about the brain and talk about the liver and other things, but it's a very common theme that you see throughout the body and how the autonomic nervous system and the innate immune system function together is that need for a burst of inflammation or a burst of sympathetic activation and then a restoration period or rebuilding period probably talked about this before, but every time we talk about this topic, I think of my dog and the fact that I've got this five-year-old puppy, we call her, and she can sit on the ground and just lie there with her tongue hanging out, sleeping for half the afternoon. And then in the mid-afternoon, when the UPS driver comes up the driveway to drop a package off, she instantly turns into this like aggressive, huffing and puffing, barking dog very intimidating she wants to be, not so much, but she's trying to be. And then 30 seconds later, as the guy's walking back down the driveway, she's back on the ground asleep with her tongue out. That ability to shift from rest and digest mode into aggressive fight or flight mode, back into all within 60 seconds, is a remarkably healthy individual, a remarkably healthy system. Human beings aren't quite so capable of doing that because whether it because our brains or our emotions get in the way, and we tend to linger in our thoughts, we tend to linger in our feelings, it's really good to get out of that. It's really good to get in that position. You know, When your friend comes up to you and says, pat you on the back and when you're angry and says, you need to get over it, you need to get past this, take a deep breath, all of those things, that's good advice. I mean, it's good advice because it's healthy. You need to be able to be resilient. You need to be able to get past challenges and things like that. And the more your mood is depressed, the more your inflammation levels are higher, the more difficult it is to do that. And what you need to do is try to restore yourself to that healthy state like my dog and be able to bounce back and forth when you need to, but get back into that state. That's why they say race car drivers. I think we've talked about that before, maybe. Race car drivers, Formula One drivers, have this remarkable ability to, when they're in those hairpin turns at 200 miles an hour, their heart rate variability goes down to zero. I mean, they're like, totally sympathetically dominated. And then when they're on the straightaways, their heart rate variability is so high, they're soaring with parasympathetic activation. So that ability to bounce back and forth is really, really important. I know that emotionally it's difficult to do, but to the extent that you can, it's a really important uh, life lesson. 
Yeah, no question about it. Just to quickly point back to your comment on osteoclasts being necessary when a fracture does occur, the best time to get a clear image on an x-ray of a fracture is actually 24 to 72 hours after the fracture has occurred, not immediately. And that's because osteoclasts have come and they've resorbed, they've taken away the, the fractured area, the injured area, and they've kind of eaten away and some of the bone actually clears up. And so the fracture line becomes a little bit clearer and it's better to see on a, an x-ray done a little bit later than the actual initial challenge. And that's why diagnosis of a fracture, you can get an initial x-ray done and they're like, ah, we don't know, it's tough to see. And then the next day, another x-ray gets done. And they're like, ah, there it is. No, like absolutely clear because the inflammation level was high. And if there wasn't a, a misalignment that occurred with the initial fracture, it's, it can be very, very difficult to catch because there's a lot of activity going on. And so x-ray is the best way to see in terms of a bone density. And so I just want to lean into the bone piece again, where we talk about how do we know what our bone density is? Do we know if we have osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is a step prior to osteoporosis? The best way to assess this is the use of radiography, specifically a DEXA scan, for those who are aware of this. A DEXA scan uh, is generally done at uh, lumbar spine, L4-5, somewhere in that area, and on the femoral neck, the neck of the femur. And those two areas are great points of reference to tell us the density of bone that's present. How dense is the bone? How much calcium, quote unquote, in general, is present in the bone there? How strong are those bones? And if you get to a score, a specific standard deviation too low, that's a sign that you have osteopenia and osteoporosis is another step below that. And so this is a great way to assess it. And radiography is a great way to, to do that, to understand if there is bone loss or not. And if you're at risk of a fracture or not, because that's where a lot of those fractures will occur. You mentioned the compression fractures at the vertebral body or the femoral neck fractures, the common, like I've slipped, I've fallen, I can't get up type of challenge that occurs with uh, the generic old age uh, thought process, right? Where the femoral neck actually fractures. And there's some evidence that the femoral neck fractures prior to the fall rather than the fall causing the femoral neck fracture. And that's because the bone has been so depleted that it fractures and then the fall will occur secondarily. So very interesting, but uh, an important piece to the puzzle. And so now if we know that we have some bone loss. We know that the calcium is starting to wear away. We know that we're at risk of these fractures or we want to prevent that from occurring at all. What are some of the things that we can do to bring that balance back? You've mentioned bringing in the sympathetic parasympathetic balance where HRV goes up and down and we want to be more resilient to those stressors that do come up. Uh, what are some of the things that we can do just generally first off and then specific things we can do to help improve bone density? Yeah, so um, I want to talk a little bit about just to sort of make a segue into that. The DEXA scan, I mean, it's a, it's a radiographic image that needs to be done. And I know that some people out there don't want to have overly exposed themselves to radiation. And so there's a resistance sometimes to getting these scans done. And I, I'm not telling people they have to, but I would say that it's a very strong sign that you probably should have it done if you're experiencing those vasomotor symptoms of menopause in a moderate to severe way, if you're sort of chronically experiencing sweating and night sweats and, and you're experiencing some mood swings that are bothersome, I think you probably do want to go in at some point and get a DEXA scan done so that you know. If it turns out that you don't have a lot of bone mineral loss, then maybe you don't have to take too many steps. You can just exercise and eat right and get good sleep and you'll be fine. If you do see that there's a drop in that mineralization, you are suffering with the onset of osteoporosis or at least the progressing towards it. One of the things that a lot of physicians will prescribe is a hormone replacement therapy. And that does work to a very large extent, but not everybody wants that. There's heightened risks of other consequences, you know, uh, cancers and other things like that. So people sometimes feel a little bit skittish about uh, about doing that. And I understand that as well, because you sort of want nature to sort of, you know, progress as it's supposed to, but you want to do it in the healthiest way possible. Um, because if nature's going to progress and 
you want to make certain you're not experiencing those vasomotor symptoms very extremely. You want to make certain that inflammation levels are low, as low as they can be. You want to get through that sympathetically activated period by countering that, pushing yourself, exercise, eating right, sleep, all those things are good. Vagus nerve stimulation is really important part of maintaining your health. You want to have that parasympathetic activation. And to the extent that in modern society, it's difficult to get that. Um, and as human beings, we tend to obsess on things and tend to be a little bit prone to causing our own sympathetic activation internally, then having a little bit of external help is a good thing. Absolutely. And that external help can come in the form of electrical vagus nerve stimulation, which is actually something that's been shown to be really beneficial. And so there's a few research studies that you and I have chatted about that talk directly about this, but the effect of this was found almost coincidentally because the the way that this was done was there were epileptic patients that had implanted vagus nerve stimulators put on the cervical branch of the vagus nerve. And they were assessed years later to identify through DEXA scan if they had bone mineral density loss or improvement. And what was found was groups of people that had vagus nerve stimulation occurring on a regular basis had increased bone mineral density and a significant significantly decreased risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia. This is, was really interesting finding and something that really shows that the acetylcholine that's going out via vagus nerve uh, initial kind of through the nerve stimulation and then the amplification via the spleen is affecting these osteoclasts and osteoblasts to remain in a more balanced state, allowing for po a probable and, and improved bone remodeling to occur for that rebuilding process to stay present longer. And it's essentially an adaptive tool that can be used to help reduce the effects of stress and creating that inflammation that's occurring throughout our body. Yeah, there's actually lots of instances. It's, it's sort of interesting the way vagus nerve stimulation for epilepsy has led to an understanding about what vagus nerve stimulation can do outside of epilepsy, largely in sort of the reverse way it normally happens. There's Normally, you, you have a theory, you test it in vitro, then you go to some rats or mice and you test the theory and, and the therapy there, and then you progress uh, ultimately into a human study where you see whether or not that therapy has an effectiveness. It's sort of backwards because, as you said, there was an observation made. Yes. Now, somebody may have had a theory as to why it would be effective and then grabbed a group of patients and looked at it. That happened at Stanford where they took 50 patients who had vagus nerve stimulators in them where they had probable non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and they showed that uh, the vagus nerve stimulators within six months had very strong benefit on sort of halting that progression, which was pretty exciting, but again, done in the reverse. So yes, there were studies done looking at human beings who had had implants put in to look to see what their bone density changes were as a result, or at least concurrent with the stimulation, and it was positive. They then went back to the animals, and they've done multiple animal studies now showing that whether it be cholinergic agonists, things that you would take as a drug, or stimulation, have that same effect you were talking about, increasing bone density, rapidly improving the healing of bones, the thickening of cortical mass, just greater deposition of and storage of calcium in bone. So yes, I think that there's evidence that vagus nerve stimulation and cholinergic agonists that bind to that alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor are beneficial for growing and healing and maintaining bone. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we end with a couple of specific recommendations that people can kind of take on as a preventative measure to not go down that path. Number one, we talked a little bit about nutrient deficiencies, calcium, magnesium in particular. This is where the eating right piece comes in. Getting good nutrient-dense foods in, getting the calcium, magnesium supplementing if necessary can be really beneficial. So dietary recommendations there will be focused on nutrient-dense foods, no question about it. Number two, we talked about exercise. And the piece that exercise plays is literally the stress of gravity helps to improve bone density. It increases osteoblast activity. It maintains good levels of osteoclast activity. And it allows for bone remodeling to occur in a very specific gravitational 
axial response. We don't need to get into the specifics there, but that will help to improve bone density. Specifically, weight-bearing exercise has been shown to be really beneficial here. So we've got the dietary piece. On the exercise piece, just a quick little fun side note here. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And if you're sitting all day, every day at your computer and you're work, sitting for eight hours and then you're sitting in the car for an hour on the way home and to work and then you're sitting at the couch and you're sitting at the dinner table and you're not getting those steps and you're not getting active, then you're not allowing the chance for those osteoblasts to do the job of building good, strong bone. And so that's a really important piece to the exercise side of things and just overall movement. Get up and move do standing desk work once in a while, do a little bit more uh, regular weight bearing type of presence. And literally, we've all heard this, you know, sitting is a new smoking. Well, this is the effect of it. We don't want to be sitting for cardiovascular reasons. We don't want to be sitting for loss of bone mineral density reasons as well and muscle function as well. So we've got diet, we've got lifestyle, practicing stress management, practicing vagus nerve activation and stimulation and electrically stimulating if need be, are great ways to help maintain good bone mass throughout your entire life. How does that sound? Anything to add to that, JP? I think that's a wonderful thing. I'd, I'd in fact, love to spend a little time on an episode in the future talking about what foods provide the best nutrients for autonomic nervous system health, and specifically, how can we eat the right foods to make certain that our parasympathetic nervous system has the right nutrients to support an anti-inflammatory environment in the body. I know just off the cuff right now, we can talk about the fact that a lot of the guidelines for good eating that came out of the government is questionable with respect to some things that are now considered important. For example, there was uh, you know, the idea of only eating one egg a day or one egg a week at one point uh, because of concerns around cholesterol, but yet eggs have a tremendous amount of choline in them, which That's is good. critically important for good autonomic nervous system health. Yeah. So, um, you know, and uh, just as a fun side note on choline, ninety percent of the Western countries, Canada, U.S., are deficient in choline. Ninety percent of the people have a, a choline deficiency, and choline as kind of the, the topic that you've brought up here is necessary in the production of, you'll never guess, acetylcholine. <laughs> so really interesting there. And then on top of that, the acetyl piece is linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. So it's almost like this cyclic uh, challenge that can occur where we're lacking choline, we're lacking mitochondrial dysfunction, and that's not allowing acetyl-CoA, so we can't produce acetylcholine, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole nother hour of this podcast if we wanted to do that. So that will definitely be a future episode to point to. Yeah, and just switching to what you said second, which was about exercise. And I'm a big believer in getting out and walking. I think walking or running are wonderful ways to help not just your bones, but your emotional state, your cardiovascular state, your respiratory state, muscular state. I mean, everything about it is just good. Yeah. Um, there's a, I think he was a Scandinavian, um, writer slash philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard, who has a passage about the importance of walking that I always like to share with people. So I'm just going to read it. It's in front of me here. He said, above all, do not lose your desire to walk. Every day I walk myself into a state of well-being and walk away from every illness. I have walked myself into the best thoughts, and I know of no thought so burdensome that one cannot walk away from it. But by sitting still, and the more one sits still, the closer one comes to feeling ill. Thus, if one just keeps on walking, everything will be all right. So again, it. wonderful words of wisdom. I, I hope everybody takes that to heart. It doesn't have to be running a six minute mile. It just can be going out and walking with a, especially doing it with a family member, like your, your wife, your husband, your kids, your grandparents, parents, just go out and walk and you'll find that life is just better. If you're having trouble figuring out where to start, literally take a step, go for a walk. It is the best starting point and often the only starting point that you need to get back to optimal health is just to start walking again. I love that quote there. And uh, I think there's no better place to end this call off than with that wonderful quote. So thank you for that, JP. 
Um, for those who got to this point in the podcast, thank you for listening. Please share this episode with anybody who you feel could use this information to upgrade their health. And we are excited to continue the conversation on how uh, to upgrade your overall health using the vagus nerve, using the autonomic nervous system, and to just feel your absolute best. Have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you on the next one. Mm-hmm.